good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to have you in this new world that we're in. Uh, we did a roadshow of talks in February and it was great to be there and, and meet everybody face to face. So uh, this is a way of still connecting and providing the education that we all agree is so important, particularly in the world we're in right now and still and, and somehow still do it with staying in our lounge room and safely at a distance while we're in this serious pandemic. Um, we're just going to go into my presentation. So it took... What, what we do is it, and why is New Way to Stay, why are we hosting this series of talks this year? I don't, I don't know, or this month and week. I don't know if you had a chance to look right through the booklet, but you might notice that we've done a few on different subjects. And this one we've chosen is psychology, um, which is such an important and often misunderstood aspect of healthcare and planning. We also help people look at aspects of their financial circumstances. We help them set them up and understand whether they might need some updating of their legal affairs, uh, looking at their home safety. We look at home care support, government benefit advice, pretty well anything uh, that's required to consider as part of planning as we transition into retirement and um, into our, our older years. Uh, we have four steps. Um, we, we are a new concept business, uh, which we built and developed out of a, a need that we felt was missing. There seem to be many, many services that all in silos, not one central coordination point that could come in as an advocate and support people through the various aspects of their life that they may feel they would like to relook at or plan for. The way that we work is it's basically a fairly simple process. We have a quick chat over the phone first, this is a one-on-one, -on -one, to understand what your questions are, whether you're concerned about anything that might be happening right now or that might happen in your future. Uh, and then we um, meet in person and we, and we uh, talk about all your goals and all the aspects that you would like researched and looked at for yourself and um, solutions. And we go away after that and we create a really good plan that's very clear and it's got detail that's important for you and personalised for your circumstances, along with um, recommendations and advice that help connect you to experts that we, with their prices and sizes that we feel would help you um, achieve what you want with your goals. We deliver that plan and we help explain all the steps. We do that in person or we can do it virtually, whatever you're more comfortable with. And, um, and we show you, and all costs are up front. And we'll even actually stay with you and advocate uh, um, after that if you would like us to uh, project manage. There might be three or four steps that you might need. I'll take you through how that works in a little bit. Um, me, I'm, I'm, my name's Louise Mace. Um, I'm the founder of New Way to Stay. We are really proud um, to be a stock and benefit plus partner. We only joined earlier this year and um, like everyone, everything changed. We did a rollout of education in February and by March, everybody was in lockdown. So this is a great way to reach out and provide the education and support that we talked about with Natalie and the team earlier in the year. Um, and pretty well, as I just talked about, that there's um, experience between myself and my directors and my team. And we all have worked in healthcare. My, I personally worked in healthcare for over 30 years and aged care. And Les, our director, has got a finance um, and legal background, as do I, I have a legal background and project management. So it's personal experience, um, really, that made us create this business, but alongside the fact that we had these really complementary skills. Um, and that's just a little slide to talk about, you know, um, what our experiences were just to demonstrate that how emotional and strongly we feel about the support our family and our parents gave us when we were growing up and how much we want to give back to them. Um, my experience with my late dad, that you can see that photo up in the right hand corner, um, was a huge instigator for me as an experienced project manager, working in aged care and healthcare. And when he had a slippery slope into a whole lot of circumstances that changed his life that he wasn't prepared for, I incorrectly thought that the project manager um, and working full time with my own family that I would be able to pull it all together for him and get the help he needed. But I realised it was a lot more sadly confusing than it, than it really, uh, most people realise it is when, when things start to change in life. And similarly, there's Les and his parents. He's going through a whole lot of 
complex situations right now, actually, and um, it's wonderful that we are now set up with this organisation and we can be advocates in such an effective and um, empathetic and transparent but trustworthy way. Um, just a few, this isn't to scare anyone, but just some sobering statistics and, and part of the drive in our research behind creating um, a gateway that allowed people to plan for many aspects of their life. In 2018, there were over four, four and a half million Australians with a disability, that's nearly 18% of the population. And we know that the prevalence of disability does increase with age. That's uh, one in nine people over 64 have a disability. And those aged 65 and over, one in two people were in statistically by the, by the ADF have some form of disability. And I will say disability we cover a broad range of things, but um, it's a reality and our bodies don't stay the same, our health doesn't stay the same, and it's very wise to think about what we want in our life, if that were to happen to ourselves or our partner, and how we would want to plan potentially ahead, rather than juggling a whole lot of balls very reactively at the last minute. It's interesting that men and women had a similar prevalence in that statistic and 5.7% uh, of all Australians have a profound or severe disability, um, which, is quite, which is quite significant. Um, part of the reason I really am excited to introduce Julie in a minute is that almost one quarter of people with disabilities have reported a mental or behavioural disorder, which is obviously probably part of their main condition um, or, or as a consequence of the pain or the disability that they're dealing with. But that's going up at an alarming rate. And Julie will talk to you more about that as well, I'm sure. But those statistics you can have a look at if you're interested yourself. But um, that's, that's the situation. We're, we're meeting some wonderful clients and seeing many, many situations now more commonly all the time of different scenarios with people who were, have been optimistic and healthy um, and planned or not planned ahead. This is just a little story about Laura and Tom. Um, that is not their name and that is not a photo of them for privacy reasons. But they have were wonderful clients of ours and their, their children reached out to us. They um, moved into a lovely retirement village um, about four years before we were brought in as their advocates. And uh, sadly, Tom had been diagnosed um, with bowel cancer. Um, he'd also actually had a heart attack not, not long before that. And um, they'd have a pretty good life where they had uh, mostly to themselves but they liked to read and watch movies they had um, their family they didn't really decide to connect with the rest of the village they just were more private people wanted to stay um get to themselves so when tom got very sick and it became quite evident that returning home um particularly in the size of their village even with home care was going to be almost impossible for claire um or laura sorry um then we you know we decided that um, they needed to look at some other solutions for them. It became, without going through that whole story, I would just say it was a very reactive situation. We did manage to help them move through a lot of um, very challenging situations more quickly and effectively and show them exactly what their choices were. But the message, I guess, for here and today is had they planned or thought and they said this themselves, um, that it would have been so so much better for them in the long run than Tom ending up in care and Laura ending up quite sad and depressed that that's where he was and it, it all happened so very quickly. Mary and Jake, on the other hand, um, very similar, moved about five years prior into a into a lovely retirement village, yes, one of the Stockman villages, and um, also very similar profile, love their movies, their friends, their families. But they decided to connect with the other residents and get involved in the community activities. And they were very proactive in that and they made wonderful friends, which was great for their family too, of course, but they, they had their own lives besides from their family. Mary, sadly, at age 84, had a stroke. It was quite unexpected and she became quite incapacitated in compared to what she had been able to do originally. Um, they, they did call in an advocacy service, which was ours. And we did help them um, get set up um, with everything they needed. It, um, and it was actually really, even though Mary had had a stroke and her outlook was not as good as it had been with her health. And we knew that, you know, that she was probably going to be 
reasonably debilitated in a way, you know, for the rest of their life. We, we were able to help them connect with solicitors and get a really good home care arrangement in place. Their home was made safer. They saw a psychologist because there was a lot to deal with and that was an important part of their mental health, they felt. Um, so it, it was a really, it was a, it was a good learning and experience in that they had a similar situation, but they had already made friends. And that was a wonderful thing, staying connected. And we do feel, and I'm not sure whether you've noticed that too, but having a community of friends around you, which is such a strong benefit of a, um, of a retirement village, is such an important part of our mental health and our physical health. So we know that reaching out to family or advocates or friends is hard. And we know we're in a really tough situation right now um, with COVID, so many of you may be feeling more locked down and away and isolated from your original life than you had before, which is really difficult. So our advice, you know, is obvious advice that we put on you for coming into all of these webinars. Stockman is so proactively putting on for you this week. Um, I think Natalie's going to talk more about that through the week too. And getting yourself educated and empowered and getting knowledge so that you can reach out to the help you need. You can check on your neighbours. It's so important to do that. Not everybody owns up that they're lonely or that they've got a health problem. Um, and just staying connected with your community is so important. And just to remember, you may not be as alone as you might think you are. Um, for those of you that do have a community or a family, some people haven't, haven't been too shy or they haven't connected with their community. They don't have family close by. So it's, I think it's important for all of us to keep our radars open and be aware of people that may or may not need help. And now without going on too much further, I'm really proud and delighted to introduce Dr. Julie Bajik-Smith, who's um, a psychologist, aged care advocate, and she's passionate about what she does. Um, I actually read quite a few articles about Julie and researched her when we were um, establishing this business quite a few years ago, and I thought I've got to make contact with this person. I loved her articles, I loved her ethos and what she was doing. And since then, Julie and I have become quite close. She's one of our partners. She teaches and trains uh, professionals who work with older people on uh, mental health and ageing. She's an educator, she's written a book, which is awesome, I've read the book. And um, yeah, so I'm really proud to introduce you to Dr. Julie. Here she is in a photo speaking at an event that we hosted with lots of other professionals. So over to Julie. Thank you everyone for joining live this morning. I've done quite a few presentations over the years in retirement villages and often people can't make the time. And I think it's wonderful that this session's getting recorded and that others can listen to it and tune to it later on, which is good. And I appreciate those of you who've come live as well. So as Louise mentioned, I'm an aged care psychologist and I specialize in working with, with older people. I've also done quite a lot of research with this population and in particularly with the workforce supporting the, the clients. So. As Louise mentioned, I've recently published a book and it is about um, well-being in, in residential care. And that's because I've done a lot of work there over the 10 years. But having said so, a lot what, what I discuss in the book is about the fact, you know, if many of those people took actions earlier and looked at the ways how they can spend their time, you know, as opposed to not doing anything their outcomes would have been better because what we know is that emotional changes in late life can in fact be improved it's not normal part of aging you know to get depressed isolated i know it's very hard with COVID at the moment but depression is a condition that affects people of all ages and just like it can be treated in earlier life it can also be treated in late life as well so i'll talk a little bit about that and i'll talk to you a little bit about um ways that we can help each other and what we can do but i just just like louise i want to talk a little bit about the background as to why we're doing what we're doing i'll just minimize video so that i'm not um and louise jump in if anyone's got questions because i'm just going to go through my slides and i've minimized the um the screen for hands and everything so i can't okay. actually see that okay thanks yep, no. so we know that the proportion of older people is growing very 
fast more so than any other age group and whilst this can be seen as a huge success for public health policies it also creates some challenges for society to adapt in order to maximize the health and functional capacity of older people as well as their social participation and security meaning that every older person is important and they still contribute a lot to their society for example in australia in 1901, 4% of population was aged 65 plus. In 2011, it was 14%. And by 2101, it's dissipated to be 25% of the population. So we, we're growing older, there's more of us, and we need to look at ways how we can look after ourselves. So when we talk about active aging, it, means the process of optimizing opportunities for health, participation and security in order to enhance quality of life as people age. It also allows people to realize their potential for physical, social and mental well-being throughout their life course and to participate in society while providing them with the adequate protection, security and care when they need. I I was talking to someone recently and they said, oh, you know, their, their aunt passed away. And I said, oh, how old was she? she? And they said, oh, you know, she died of old age. And I said, well, how old was this lady? And they said, oh, she was 69. I said, well, 69, old age, it's not, it's just the beginning. They still have time ahead of them. And, you know, it was later found out that, you know, she, she had a stroke and she passed away suddenly. So I think that when we talk about active aging, it doesn't mean that life is over once a person retires. It doesn't mean life is over once they, you know, are no longer able to drive. There's so much that people can contribute. I, I know personally a 92 year old lady who comes to nursing homes to visit old people. So I think you're only as old as you as, as you feel. And it's certainly nothing about the actual number. So I've got some true or false questions here for you. And I would like to, um, how are we going to do this? Because you're all on mute. So let's maybe, I'll read them out to you and shake your head or nod. So number one, do you think that depression is a common and normal part of aging? No. Okay. Number two, dementia is a part of normal aging? No, there is no cure for dementia. Is that true or false? So there's, it's, it's quite hard. There's no cure for dementia. That's true. But we know that there's a lot can, that can be done to slow down the progression of the disease. People under the age of 65 do not get dementia. They do, and that's called early onset of dementia. Um, I actually knew someone who was in their 30s and they got dementia. Uh, pain is a natural part of the aging process. No, false. So pain is usually a symptom of something that's going on. It's underlying and usually can be treated. Uh, most older adults who have no desire or capacity for sexual relationships other uh in other words, most older adults are typically asexual. False. And the majority of older adults say that they're happy most of the time. True. Excellent. So when we talk about active aging, we are talking about looking at ways to extend healthy life expectancy and quality of life for all people as they age. Now, what are psychologists? What do they do? I often get asked that and people sometimes assume that I can read their mind and it's certainly not the case. If I did, I would know the lot on numbers as well. So psychologists are experts in human behavior and they have studied the brain, memory, learning, human development and the processes determining how people think, feel, behave and react. Psychologists apply their expertise using reliable and scientifically supported methods and psychological therapies are widely used to treat individuals and families and can also be applied to groups and organizations. So it's a very wide overview and spectrum of what psychologists do. And when we talk about successful aging, we're talking about aging that is free from cognitive disturbances and free from emotional disturbance. And, you know, when, when we talk about that, that's in a very wide um, setting. I think it's normal 
that everyone responds emotionally to what is going on this year because of the way that our lives have been affected and we're no, no, not able to interact with our friends as freely as we used to, to travel as freely as we used to and to live our lives. So this is a event that is outside of our normal lives. What constitutes su successful aging includes having good support network, keeping active and getting early intervention. So if there's any um, niggling pain or discomfort, getting that checked out. If there's anything that um, you know is emotionally upsetting us, having a chat about it, going to a doctor, getting you know getting some perspective as to what is going on. Those are the three key aspects of being able to achieve successful aging. So good support network, keeping active, and having early intervention. And I know for some people, you know, um, the good support network doesn't necessarily have to mean you know, having a lot of people support you. It could just be one or two people. It could also be just having a good relationship with your GP or having a friend to call when you're not having a great day. It doesn't have to be a cast of thousands of people, you know, and, and be, it, it is more about the quality than quantity. There are a lot of people who have a lot of people around them and they still feel lonely. Um, it's really about the, the quality of your interactions, the quality of your activities, and, and, and getting that early intervention. So this is a very important slide um, because it it really um, summarizes my entire presentation and pretty much all my work in, in, in aged care and when we talk about psychology of aging. So it underpins two very important concepts which are which um, review the the changes that happen in late life and and we all go through changes in our lives and 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 how um how we age and what what goes on so the two main aspects include the slow growers and the surprise attackers so the slow growers are changes that happen slowly and gradually so it could be a retirement just the aging process itself empty nesting balancing life and activities and, and obviously like going through the midlife as well. And then we have another change, which is called the surprise attackers. So it's when things happen quite quickly. So it could be serious illness, shocking events that happen, unexpected move or death of a loved one. The surprise attackers are usually things that happen quite quickly, rapidly, often overnight. And when I do my seminars and presentations, I always go back to that question, was the change quick? Or was it slow? Usually if the change was quick and the person, you know, um, had a medical episode and ended up in hospital and something happened, your ability to process about what has happened, um, it, it, it's, it's actually a lot harder because one second your life was completely normal and then overnight it changed. And then when we talk about the slower growth, the things that happen slowly over time, they usually are the ones where you can really make those little changes along the way to, to, to achieve successful aging as, as best as you can. Having said so, I've seen people who have had both changes that happen quickly and slowly and who have adapted later on. It's just that the approach needs to be a little bit different um, according to what type of transition it was. So what I wanted to do now is I know we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different life experiences. But the Wheel of Life is one exercise when I do with people that really helps people of all ages. So all that you'd need to do is you're not probably going to do it now because you're not going to have time to do it now. But all I wanted you to do is just to get a piece of paper and draw a circle on that and divide it into eight segments. OK. And it's a very good visual um, exercise that you can do and it doesn't take a lot of time to do. So I've done this exercise with carers um, and people who look after, you know, someone who's not well, like their spouses. So they, they you know, you'll, I'll just demonstrate. I can see Louise is going to do it as well. But if you just do a circle and just divide it, you know, just like that. It's a very quick and visual tool to do. 
I probably should have mentioned it earlier that we're going to do it. But anyway, even if you do it later, it's really, really um, good thing to do. So we each segment of this wheel is going to represent an, an important part in your life. OK, so we've got here things like health, wealth, family, friends, recreational or hobbies, relationships, spiritual or personal growth, career, job, volunteering, community and physical environment. So that includes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So in each section of the pie, one section represents where, where you at, like, you know, health, family, you just need to label the wheel according to what is what is for you. So some of you who are working, you can put job, some of you could be volunteering. Um, you just personalize it according to you, right? And then what we're going to do is right in the middle of the circle, that, that black dot represents a zero, okay? And all the way up the top represents a 10, okay? So if I write something like health, um, money, family. So if we look at something like health, you know, where would you score yourself on the health? If you got from zero to 10, where do you think it is? So for myself, I'll put myself at about say seven. And then next one being financially. Are you happy where you financially? Is it five? Is it six? Where you are on the wheel? And then next one would be family. How happy are you with your family and connections? So you're going to go around the wheel and do for each one of those aspects of health, wealth, family, recreation, your relationships, your personal growth, spiritual, religious, whatever you want to call that section. And then once you complete all that, I would like you to join the dots. Okay, so I'll just illustrate what that might look like. So you might come up with something like that. Look like a bit like a spider web at the end of it. Okay, when you connect all your dots. So if you feel equally fulfilled in all areas of your life, the wheel will be perfect and it will sp spin smoothly, right? But if your scores are similarly low in each area, the right might be smooth, but you're not living up to your potential, right? So if you have a, a circle that's a bit like that, you know, financially things are not great, but you've got great family, it might make what's called a bumpy ride, right? But the aim of this really simple exercise is to illustrate to you where are those areas where you might need a little bit more help? Is it about your health? Is it about your family, friends, learning, your environment? It's a really good visual tool and it's not um, you know, a psychological test that people worry about. It's just something that you can keep for yourself. And it's a really good idea to do it when you just feel a little bit overwhelmed about what's going on to actually figure out what, what is it that's affecting you and where are things for you right now. So I hope this was a little exercise that can really help you understand what's going on for you at this point of time. Okay. So when we talk about well-being in late life, I know for the fact that a lot of older people have better mental health outcomes than younger people. We also know that a lot of people, older people actually live in their homes. They don't live in residential aged care facilities. Only about 5% do. And to be able to move into an aged care facility as well, um, you, you need to qualify for that. So it's a very small proportion of people that live in aged care homes. We also know that Mental health in late life is usually affected by changes. You know how I was talking in an earlier slide about slow growers or the sudden changes. So the changes that usually contribute to changes in how we feel in late life is changes in our health status, accumulation of grief and loss. So it could be 
it, you know, a friend passing away and a relative dying and a loss of um, driver's license. Limited support network is another risk factor as well, as well as isolation, which is huge. We, we're not meant to live alone and isolated. What's going on this year is really, really quite extraordinary and it's affecting a lot of people and their well-being. So some of the symptoms of depression in late life include have, experiencing pain, multiple physical symptoms, memory problems, weight loss, slowing down in movement, uh, anxiety, using different language, talking about nerves, and overall less likely to describe sadness. So it's, um, depression is essentially the same disorder across lifespan, but for people in late life, they tend to have more physical symptoms that they report more so than young people. Young people don't often talk about their pain or, or you know, um, problems with their bowels, but a lot of depression tends to in late life be more about those physical symptoms. So it's really important to know that it's the same condition across the lifespan, but that in late life, the symptoms are more physical. And what is also important to know is that just because you're having a bad day, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily depressed. The symptoms need to be present for at least two continuous weeks before we would say that someone is likely to have depression. So it's no good, you know, um, just saying if someone's having a bad day or they're depressed. It, it is more so about how long the symptoms have been there. Anxiety in late life is far less researched than depression. It can also be situation dependent. So if someone goes to a hospital or if they've been um, moved from one place to another, they can you know, make them feel more anxious. And it's often easier to recognize because you can see those physical symptoms. So symptoms can include being fearful, agitated, having sore muscles and, and multiple worries. And what it means about sore muscle is that if people hold a lot of tension, they're likely to experience that muscle pain and especially in, in their jaw and in their face. Usually um, anxiety in late life has a history of anxiety in earlier life, but depression, not necessarily so. So people can get depressed in late life and never having had a history of depression. But if they get anxious in late life, they've usually had anxiety earlier on in their life as well. So where what do people you know what is my suggestion what do what do i think people can do to um to get better so it includes reconnecting with elderly relative friend or neighbor this is what i encourage a lot of people to do sometimes i think we can all be too much inside our own bubble that we don't necessarily want to mix with people particularly if we're not having a great day promoting new activities trying out new things um, learning technology, like I, I thank you all for coming today because I think figuring out how to work Zoom takes quite a bit, bit of skill. And, I, you know, even for me and Louise this morning, figuring out how to get online was an exercise in itself as well. Even though I use Zoom, we both use Zoom all the time, just figuring out this this meeting and how to coordinate that, you know, took a bit of time and we had training and how to do it last week as well. Reducing isolation is really important and encouraging to seek help when needed. So it's really good to also discuss in consultation with elderly people, changes of circumstance, environment, and if there are any changes in health as well. I think, you know, the, the bottom line from this slide is really to look at ways how we can connect with one another rather than be alone and, and experience things isolated on our own. And this is a lot about what I talk in, in the book as well. The book is not necessarily about moving into nursing nursing home. It's about late life and what people can do um, to feel better in late life. And it's not it's not about going seeing a doctor, getting on medication straight away, looking at these other strategies as well. No pill is going to improve your quality of life. It's more so about activities that you do. And this is often what I discuss in my training as well. It's about how we connect with one another. You know, you might not be able to go bushwalking anymore, but you know, are there other ways that you can keep physically active? There's now, you know, even on YouTube and, um, in, and, and Zoom, there's exercises you can do seated in your chair, you can do yoga, you can do different types of activities that will really be um, beneficial. So the self-care tips that I have is 
um, recognizing if we can talk to someone that we trust about how we feel. As I said earlier, it's not necessarily about having a lot of a lot of people that can um, be in our lives. It's just having about those quality relationships. Also, self-care tips include asking yourself, am I getting regular exercise? And as a mother of two young kids, that's really hard for me at the moment, getting exercise, but I know how important it is for me. So I pray to God that they're going to be asleep at 7.30 so I can do my exercise at night time. Um, on Zoom, um, am I getting enough rest? And it's also about that balance between getting enough rest and sleeping too much. You know, a lot of people that I meet, um, that you know say they're tired they sleep a lot sleeping more and more is not gonna get you rested you like sometimes you need to actually be active to have that balance between rest and being active and am i eating regularly as well so important and something that we can neglect particularly if we are on our own you might not be tempted to cook three meals a day you don't need to cook three meals a day but eating food regularly is really important so that's all I wanted to talk to you about this morning. I didn't want to, you know, cut off at the end of it. I wanted to ask any questions if you have. And so I'll put back to Louise now um, to, to do that um, and to, yeah, go through that if people have questions for her as well. Great presentation. I've sat through quite a few of Julie's presentations and every single time I learn something new, I love that exercise too. I'm actually a great believer in, um, you know, we, we talk about age and you mentioned numbers but what is age what is the numbers shouldn't we be thinking about psychology and and the way that we live and how and how we look at different aspects of our life always as mm. adults once we're adults and no longer living at home